Hi. All right. As you can see, I'm Joel Dudley uh, from Mount Sinai School of Medicine and here in New York. And I think what's wonderful is, uh, you know, I have not, I didn't, we weren't synchronized in our presentations. I, uh, I didn't talk to any of the previous speakers before this. And uh, you'll see a lot of themes uh, uh, sort of reinforced and, and re you know, presented again in a different way. So I think it really uh, speaks to uh, the DARPA group here who put this, uh, this team together of folks and they really understood the message. And, uh, and uh, you know, sort of the perspective that all the speakers are bringing. So I'm very happy to see that. Yeah. So I think one of the uh, impressions I hope you walk away with here is, is, is you know, best represented by this quote here. It's one of my favorite quotes by William Gibson, is a science fiction author. The future is here. It's just not very evenly distributed. A lot of the things that uh, the previous speakers uh, talked about, and then I, and probably speakers after me are going to talk about, they seem like science fiction, but it's all here. I mean, all the components exist. And what we're really missing is sort of the, the opportunities and the efforts to really put all these uh, individual com technology components together that seem like science fiction to sort of realize uh, these almost science fiction sounding uh, uh, opportunities and outcomes that everybody's talking about today. And uh, again, I'd like to uh, stress a view that I think was represented by the previous speakers about, the co about complexity in, in biology and health. And what I really, how I always look at, at, at biology and, and health in particular, because I'm at a medical school focusing on diseases, is by recognizing that there are rarely smoking guns in human health. What do I mean by that? There's rarely the one magic gene that's the answer to all of our problems in terms of, of understanding disease mechanisms or in terms of treating a disease. What we're really looking for here is smoking gunships. Uh, one example I want to bring up is inflammatory bowel disease, so Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis. Genome-wide association studies for the, that particular disease alone have identified over 200 regions of the genome that are reliably, repeatedly associated with that one disease. Those 200 regions of the genome don't even explain 50% of the heritability, so don't even explain 50% of the genetic component of that disease. So when things are all said and done, for Crohn's disease alone, you know, we're probably going to have eight or 900 regions of the genome, so you could almost think of it as 900 genes that underlie this disease. And that's only explaining the genetic component. That doesn't even explain all the environmental factors that influence that disease. So unbelievable complexity. How are you going to go from all that complexity down to drug targets, right? And, um, and there's no such thing as a simple disease. One of my pet peeves is when we talk about genetic diseases is we actually, even in the field today, they separate genetic diseases into complex diseases like diabetes and, and, and Crohn's disease and heart disease and simple genetic diseases. Often people will say, it. I find it a very obnoxious, uh, incorrect term. So one example here is this is a, a nice uh, Nature Reviews genetics article on, on cystic fibrosis. So cystic fibrosis, this is a gene, CFTR, we've known as the single genetic causal driver of cystic fibrosis of this disease for almost 20 years now. I think it's over 20 years. We've known this single, uh, or all the disease can really be explained from the genetic basis in a single gene. Yet this is all the complexity of how the disease manifests in the body, right? So we often think of it as a lung disease, but this one genetic mutation leads to all these complex manifestations across the entire body. And of course, even though we've known the single genetic uh, driver of this disease for almost 20 years, we haven't been able to cure it, uh, or not even really close to a cure, even though there are some promising drugs uh, coming down the line. And this is Woody Guthrie, a musician who had Huntington's disease, same thing. We know the single genetic causal driver of this disease for, for decades, and we still haven't, uh, you know, cured the disease. And one thing that we must really appreciate, or the way that I always look at, at trying to understand disease or human biology, is that appreciating that there's complex multi-scale networks that, under, that underlie all of human physiology. So inside one single cell in the body, don't focus on the body, just focus on one cell. Inside one cell, you have metabolite networks, you have non-coding RNA networks, you have transcriptional networks, you have protein networks, you have exosomes, you have, I could go on and on about all the different types of networks. Hundred thousands of interactions amongst themselves and then also between themselves, right? Protein will bind to DNA, uh, metabolites will, bind, will interact with proteins. That's just in one cell, you have this entire universe of interactions. Those cells organize into tissues, there's communication across the cells, tissues organize into organs, organs have communications across physiology. And if everything in this box is all we had to worry about, life would be good, because we could actually model this as sort of a closed you know, thermodynamic kind of system here, like in a physics way. Uh, but unfortunately, the environment interacts with this system you know, in very complex ways. So when we're ever thinking about a, comp a, p a component of biology, say a disease that we're interested in, we can't ignore all this complexity. Just because we're looking at an eye disease doesn't mean you can ignore the kidneys, right? Even though that's what we do today. We silo the way we think about these diseases. Humans are complex adaptive systems like much of uh, you know, other creatures and forms of life. 
And we know things about complex adaptive systems. They have particular characteristics. They evolve over time. There's interactions, they have in, and they have an underlie the system. The whole is always greater than the sum of the parts. And this is a key phrase, uh, you can't understand the whole system by looking at its parts. Who said this? You know, the investment bankers, as much of grief as we give them, uh, actually uh, are pretty uh, uh, forward thinking in terms of embracing complexity. I always say that if there's a clinician or a biologist that has a quote as good as this one on complexity and complex adaptive systems, I'll update my slides, but uh, haven't been uh, able to do that yet. So for now, the investment bankers uh, stay. So even though we know all this complexity underlies biology, um, you might, you know, and I'm lecturing you here, and you're like, okay, Joel, I understand. I know all this. I went to school. I understand this complexity. Why do we have a hard time embracing it? There's a couple reasons. One, if you study psychology, you know that human brains are wired for narrative, right? So when we see things that are complex, we like to think of simple stories behind the complexity, right? If lightning's coming from the sky, there must be some guy named Zeus up there throwing lightning bolts down, right? That's the reason for that happening. Or we have orthodoxies, right? So it's easy to laugh at these orthodoxies. Uh, maybe a world market for five computers. And these people were not unintelligent people, right? And these people are at the forefront of their field at the time, right? Very smart, but, but said things that are very silly. And as we're laughing at these things, I always like to think, well, what is the thing I believe today that if I put it on this slide, you know, there's another group of people in this room 20 years from now, or 30 or 40 years from now, are going to look at whatever I say, and it's going to be just as ridiculous as uh, seeming as these things. And I just took a guess that maybe biological processes are organized into simple pathways, like we learned in high school biology. Maybe that's the thing that is just as ridiculous as these other things. So this is uh, the brochure, effectively, for the institute where I work at Mount Sinai. It's a fairly new institute, just a few years old. The Icon Institute for Genomics and Multiscale Biology. It's head by uh, Eric Schott, who's a, really a pioneer in, in systems biology. Um, our mission is really to build, uh, organize the digital universe of information to build better models of disease and drug response. Of course, we're interested in biomedical data, uh, represented by this gray sphere here, but we're not going to ignore all the other data that can inform or improve our models, whether that be uh, you know, financial data, Twitter streams, whatever. There's no reason we wouldn't want to incorporate that data into our models. So something really interesting happened in, in biology over the last several years, last decade, or even a little bit less. It's actually you know, quite astounding, and, and, and that's, uh, of course, the advent of genomics technologies. So it started really with think technologies, uh, multiplex technologies like gene expression microarrays, a little chip the size of your th a thumbnail that could uh, measure the expression levels, how much a gene was turned on or off uh, in, in a particular tissue or a cell. And the, the one thing that was new about this technology is if you were interested in measuring one gene, it, was, it measured all the other genes for the same price, right? It was a chip that measured all the genes at once. So even biologists are usually, even though biologists are usually interested in just one gene, they got for the same price all the genes measured. And now, of course, we have next generation sequencing technology that replaced this. Um, so if you're interested in one bacteria, you can actually measure the whole microbiome, essentially the same, you know, the same price. If you're interested in one gene, you can measure the whole genome, measure all the, all the bases of DNA. And now we can actually, in biology, measure much, much more than we know and understand. Um, this is actually a, a new thing for biology. Um, and this data is actually accumulating in public data repositories like Gene Expression Omnibus at, a, at an exponential rate. So I, I like to so call this uh, biology's atom smasher moment because physicists actually had, to deal, you know, had this opportunity a little bit well, uh, earlier with things like atom smashers, right? So instead of thinking about, hmm, I wonder how the universe is wired up, I'm gonna make a hypothesis, I'm gonna test this very narrow hypothesis. They have the ability with atom smashers to just you know, smash atoms into pieces, collect the data, and let the data sort of tell them how, how the universe is put together, right? So going from this very narrow hypothesis driven to being a very data driven science. Uh, and physicists really accept this pretty well today, except biologists are having a hard time accepting uh, the fact that we can do data driven biology and medicine now, uh, even though we have the tools to do it. Here's a very sim simple example of how this really uh, upsets or challenges uh, long-held beliefs in biology. So this is from uh, work I did when I was a PhD student at Stanford, where there's all these databases accumulating in the public domain, uh, measuring all, all these different diseases. And of course, these, I mentioned these gene chips. So if you're measuring one gene, you essentially measures all the genes at the same time. So even though this particular person uh, interested in asthma might have only been interested in two or three of these, gene, these genes, they got, of course, all the genes measured on these chips. And of course, there's all these investigators uh, looking at many, many other diseases. So I pulled down data on several hundred uh, diseases. And of course, these chips are measuring all the genes, no matter what disease you're looking at, if the disease is going up or down. Uh, you can see if it's blue or yellow relative to the healthy state. 
And instead of just focusing on one disease at a time, like the original investigator who uploaded this data set, I could put it together in this really simple two-dimensional matrix, and I could actually look at the whole uh, molecular landscape of human disease at a 10,000-foot view and ask interesting questions like, if the relationship among diseases at the molecular level, does that actually look anything like the, the taxonomy, if you will, of human diseases that we use in the clinic today, right? So the clinic, we use symptoms and anatomy-based characteristics to organize diseases, right? This is a heart disease because it affects the heart tissue. Um, and it's related to this other disease because it also affects the heart. But now we have genomic data, molecular data, and, and what I did in this particular uh, work from uh, several years ago was to take all this genomic data now and rebuild the taxonomy of human disease based on molecular data, genomic data, looking at genome-wide perturbation. So if, if these two diseases are connected, it means that at a genome-wide level, they shared many more characteristics, so many more disruptions in the same pathways, et cetera, at a genome-wide level than you'd expect by random chance alone. And you find very weird things like Alzheimer's disease at a molecular level looks a lot like actinic keratosis. So actinic keratosis is a skin disease. It makes almost no sense when you look at it at first glance. I've been showing this slide a lot in talks, and at one point someone raised their hand and said, this makes perfect sense to me. And I said, okay, I'd love to hear why. And they said, if you rem remember developmental biology, um, the brain and the skin kind of come from the same uh, stem cell lineage. They form a structure called the neuroectoderm, and then they kind of go their separate ways and become different tissues, right? But what, they're, what they told me, and which makes perfect sense, is maybe when the tissue, when, when disease happens and the parts start breaking down, that shared developmental history is still reflected molecularly, right? So the, the same sort of mod, uh, modules or components are shared among these things. They're used in different ways, but when they break, they look the same, right? So the same parts are sort of breaking down in a different tissue context. It looks like a different disease. So in two months ago, there's a paper published by a group in Mexico, from Mexico that said, uh, they looked at the skin, and I don't, I don't know what drove them to do it, but they started looking at the skin of Alzheimer's disease patients, and they, they claimed in the paper that they could see tau tangles and plaques forming in the skin of the, of the Alzheimer's disease patients at the, you know, around the same time that the disease is forming. So, so you know, this, now, now we have many reasons to, to appreciate why Alzheimer's disease might look like a skin disease. However, if we had not used a data-driven approach to identify these connections, of course, you would have asked experts, and they said there's no way these diseases are related. So, and another idea when you start seeing connections like this is if there's diseases we thought were very dis dissimilar, uh, and one, one disease has, uh, but they're actually very similar at the molecular level, one disease has lots of drugs, another disease has few drugs, well, these things are much more similar than we thought. Can we think of borrowing or repurposing drugs across diseases? This is a big focus on my, on my research. So uh, one of the things we did Previously, was using these sort of unexpected data-driven connections to find that an anticonvulsant drug could treat inflammatory bowel disease. So this drug does not hit any targets you'd ever expect would treat inflammatory diseases. Um, but here is as a, as a chemical model I'll go through quickly just for the sake of time. Healthy colon, uh, a disease being induced, and then to pyramate the anti-epilepsy drug, uh, treating inflammatory bowel disease better than, the, than a, a corticosteroid. And this is a microscopic version of the same thing. To pyramate, uh, allowing mucosal healing had another paper, um, similar approach, taking this sort of data-driven approach, network-based approach, and finding that amipramine could potentially treat small cell lung cancer. Amipramine is a tricyclic antidepressant, antipsychotic drug. Um, if you looked at the targets of this drug and you had asked experts in cancer if this drug could ever potentially treat uh, ca uh, cancer, they'd say, you know, none of these targets are cancer targets, right? And if you start knocking down, so this drug hits about eight different targets. If you start knocking down individual targets, no single target actually has effectiveness against the cancer. It's actually combinations of targets of things like histamines and calcium channels, which are like uh, you know, anti-acid and, and uh, heart medication targets. But in combination, they induce a complex pattern that treats uh, small cell lung cancer. So this is a, a bunch of mice uh, that had a uh, knockout uh, uh, to, to induce small cell lung cancer. So essentially, a bunch of mice had lungs that looked like this. They got a mipramine. Looked like this. Um, and then bep Bepardil and Promethazine, which are heart medications, and these are non-cancer uh, drugs, also had activity against uh, human small cell lung cancer and mouse xenograft models, and actually worked against uh, neuroendocrine tumors as well. So, you know, again, if I had asked experts whether this drug was worth exploring for cancer, I would have been, you know, probably screamed at, and I had probably have, you know, prints on my rear end from, from people kicking me out of their office. But by taking a, a data-driven approach, you know, we, we shine the light on completely new pathways 
for treating this particular disease. Have another paper I don't have time to talk about now, just accepted in Nature Biotech, showing that we can actually take this principle down to the cell level, and we, we can actually predict uh, unexpected effects of drugs uh, down to the specific immune cells, for example. Of course, we can take this approach uh, out of the, you know, the genomic level and the cellular level and up to the patient level and really understand the complexity of patient populations. This is a great opportunity I have at Mount Sinai. So at Mount Sinai, we have an interesting resource called the Mount Sinai Biobank, BioMe Biobank, where approximately 30,000 of our patients have consented to have uh, their DNA uh, collected and, and, and genotyped. And of course, we have uh, all their electronic medical record data, actually longitudinally, that we actually can, uh, you know, com combine with this data. And these patients are consented for recontact and re-identification. So what that means is we can call them back up, and if they so uh, choose to, uh, to work with us, we can actually start collecting microbiome, immune profiling data, RNA data, and layer all that data together. And then also look at the relationship with um, uh, their clinical record. So what are the opportunities here? Um, so this is a project that's very close to being published. Um, what I'm really interested in in the medical environment is building this or realizing this vision of a learning healthcare system. What really irritates me as a patient is when you go to a hospital, they sort of say, okay, Joel, you're a 38-year-old Caucasian male in New York, and I'm going to sort of treat you based on what we know about that demographic. What they don't do is measure a bunch of things about me and say, oh, what patients ever looked like Joel and what happened to those patients in a data-driven way and what path did those pa patients take? So this is an effort to try to start realizing that learning healthcare system idea, also sort of the idea behind the precision medicine initiative. So in this particular network, all the node is actually not a gene or a drug, it's actually a patient. So what I did is I took, all, took these patients in this, in this BioMe Biobank and I, I took all their objective clinical measures, like their blood tests and their height, their weight. There's something like 500 clinical variables that we had measured on them. Because if we look at, for example, complete blood counts, even though they might be interested in just your white blood cell count, we get all, all these other blood count measures. So I represented each patient by these 500 or so variables. And I didn't say, oh, this patient has Crohn's disease or diabetes, so they should be paired with this other diabetes patient. I said, based on the raw data, the raw measurements from their blood tests, what patients look like this patient, like this patient, so patients are similar and are close to each other if they, sh if they are similar across these 500 variables, this higher dimensional clinical phenotype space. So X and Y don't mean anything. Um, the only thing that means anything is sort of the topology of, of this network. I have no idea why it looks like South America and a giant fish. That's just the, uh, everybody is always worried about Brazil and what's going on with Brazil uh, here, but no, it's, yeah, there's no, no, no geography. It's just, again, the problem with the human mind and seeing patterns in tea leaves here. But, um, I can tell you if you're a new patient at Mount Sinai, at least you want to be over here. You don't want to be on this blob. I call this cardiometabolic island, and that's probably one of the nicest things I can say about it. Um, so what, what the coloring here represents, though, is very interesting. So what I did in this case is I said, okay, now, given this network, I took the definition of what we, we believe is type 2 diabetes today, one of these sort of artificial buckets and how, or ways that we define a disease. So based on the current clinical definition of type 2 diabetes, show me where all the diabetes patients are. And the red really re represents sort of an intensity or enrichment of diabetes patients. So these are type 2 diabetic patient hotspots, right? So there, there are many more type 2 diabetic patients here than you'd expect by random chance. It even kind of starts to warm up here on the shore before you jump over to this place. But what's interesting to me is they're not all in one spot, right? And I have genetics in all these individuals. So what I actually left the genetics out of the clustering. I kept it out separately. So this grouping is not informed by genetics. So now I can do a, 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 a test here where I can actually grab this group and this group, which is now a diabetes group that's emergent in a data-driven uh, fashion, right, from the patient population, not being constrained by our sort of traditional uh, way we define diabetes. And I can say, what are the genetic differences between this group and this group? If I do that, I can, you know, I get a pancreatic a beta cell uh, gene. But the big idea behind it is this. Now this is just looking at the type 2 diabetes patients alone minus all the other patients, and, I, and no matter what I do in terms of the parameters of the clustering, I get three very consistent clusters, and the idea is right under our noses, right in our own patient population at Mount Sinai, did we have type 2, type 3, and type 4 diabetes and not even realize it? So I can tell you that these, so right now the coloring is male, female. Um, just these clusters are not being driven by ethnicity, age, or, or gender, or anything like that. And why we got excited about these clusters is, remember, we have all the medical record data on these patients over many years. So even though these are all type 2 diabetic patients, and all type 2 diabetic patients have, for example, increased risk of heart attack, one of these groups has much higher risk than the others. Uh, one of these groups um, 
this group in particular has a very high cancer risk population. So there's an interesting axis that connects diabetes and cancer that's not well understood. Um, diabetes increases your risk of cancer. Um, there's a drug called metformin, which is a very popular diabetes drug. Metformin actually reduces your risks of cancers uh, very broadly, almost to the point that you know you could almost—it's one of these drugs that maybe should be in the water. Um, so, but but why this diabetes drug reduces your risk of cancer? Nobody knows why. Um, so there's this interesting axis no one understands. So this group, if I come up with names for them, this is sort of a skinny immune diabetes. This is sort of a uh, overweight traditional metabolic diabetes group. This is a weird uh, cancer diabetes group. So, and we can see very significant differences, for example, even in retinopathy, retinopathies, nephropathies, and other comorbidities among these groups. So, uh, even though they're all treated as type 2 diabetics, we see there's big differences. And why we got really excited, and uh, you know, can share the paper with anyone who's interested in the details, was remember we kept the genetics separate from the clustering. So then I could do genetic association tests. I, we have 30 million uh, regions of the genome measured on all these patients and say, are there any genes that are different or genetic markers that are different between this group, this group, and this group? There's actually a bunch. And actually what was really interesting was they actually corroborate what we see in the clinical uh, manifestation. So what I mean by that is the group that had much, I think it was this group, had higher risk of heart attack and um, uh, nephropathies and retinopathies compared to the other type 2 diabetics had many, many more rare genetic variants in things like vascular endothelial pathways and things like that. So, so even though the genetics was not used to inform the clustering, we saw a very strong corroboration between the biological differences and the genetics between these groups and the manifest you know, diff clinical differences. And maybe even those genetic markers could be used to bin these patients, right? Uh, and this is something that we could extend to many other complex diseases, right? To learn from the data really what the true uh, definitions or topology of these, uh, these are. But, you know, clinical data is very, very sparse. You know, we're lucky if people come in once a year. And I'm actually shocked that we got anything from that analysis, to be honest. So uh, one of the big challenges we have, of course, is, is filling in the, the phenotype data. So before I go into how we're trying to accomplish that at Mount Sinai, I want to create a contrast in your mind. So this is a modern Formula One race car. Has 200 data feeds, collects five gigabytes of data per lap. Uh, cu beautiful custom iPad app for tracking the performance of the car in real time. Uh, this is the Oracle boat that just won the America's Cup uh, not that long ago. 300 sensors, 3,000 variables, measured every tenth of a second. 200 gigabytes of data generated per day. Custom iPad app for tracking the performance of the car in real time. This is what happens when you're born in an American hospital today. Uh, you get a, uh, you get a uh, little card, hopefully, Still will be filled out with pen, pencil and paper, uh, depending on where you are. Thankfully not at Mount Sinai, it's actually digital. Um, little, this used to compute what's called a, an APGAR score to see uh, you know, how healthy you are. You get a heel prick, I'll look at PKU and a couple other genes to make sure you're, you don't have any of these devastating uh, diseases. You get a birth certificate, you get a slap on the rear end and say, come back and see us when you're sick, right? So, um, so just striking to me the amount of technology that we put into cars and boats, but not yet people. Of course, this is all changing, uh, or at least the opportunity to change this is, is, is at hand. Um, we're on the crest of a, really a tsunami in consumer sensor technologies. If you go to Silicon Valley, there's probably, you know, I don't know, three, four hundred companies funded right now. Um, maybe that's uh, uh, an underestimate, I'm not sure. On uh, making uh, digital health uh, apps wearable devices, this is a, you know, EEG brain sensor. Um, iPhone urinalysis, this is the Scanadu Scout which is one of the front runners in the Qualcomm Tricorder X Prize. So the first company to make a Star Trek Tricorder that scans you and gets your vitals without touching you, gets I think 20, 30 million dollars from Qualcomm. They don't do that yet, but you hold it to your temple, I just got mine in the mail two weeks ago, you, you hold it to your temple and it gets your blood pressure, your heart rate, your temperature, et cetera. So not quite uh, touchless, but getting there. The companies like MC10 uh, making, of course, printable tattoo biosensors almost, they look like Cracker Jack box uh, uh, tattoos. Um, and I like to point out that not even diapers are going to be safe from the quantified uh, or the sense of revolution. Uh, sadly, my kids are too old uh, to wear these, but I'm, hold I'm waiting for the adult version uh, to come out. <laughs> so, uh, and of course, there's companies like uh, Theranos, who uh, has a very good PR department, so I'm sure you've heard about them. Um, but what's interesting is that you may not be aware is that uh, one month ago, Theranos actually successfully lobbied the Arizona State Legislature to pass a bill. Uh, so in, it, actually starting in July in Arizona, you can actually get all the standard clinical blood tests you normally get in the hospital from Theranos clinics in Walgreens in Arizona without a doctor's order. So the doctor's been completely cut out of the, of the blood test uh, prescribing uh, chain in Arizona. Direct-to-consumer blood tests, 
Um, and actually LabCorp, not to be left out, uh, who competes with Theranos, actually uh, quickly announced that they would also now allow you to get all the blood tests directly from LabCorp in Arizona under this new law. Of course, companies like Wellness Effects that are even ready to catch this information and plot it out for you. And why, why do I think, uh, why do I get excited about these wearable sensor devices other than I'm an early adopter? It's because we're really, really missing the rich phenotype and environmental information that will really help us extract all the value and understanding out of the genome. Because uh, the, the function of the genome is really about context. So uh, there's a, there's a, a relationship that we often look at in the genome when we're trying to understand functional parts of the genome, what parts of the genome uh, relate to function, and I'm, I'm sure it's actually most of the genome. But there's a concept called an EQTL, expression quantitative trait locus. And all this means is that at particular regions of the genome, people with, uh, at this one position, people with different genotypes can have different expression levels of genes. You could even, it doesn't have to be a gene, it could even be like a, a blood marker of a stress marker like CRP or, or something like that but there's expression quantitative trait loci. So what they'll do is they put a bunch of, of cells in a dish, and then they'll look at the expression levels of genes and look at, at the genome and try to find these correlations between uh, differences in, in, in genotype and expression levels of a gene. And they'll say, oh, there's an expression quantitative trait loci, but we usually say, where are they? But actually, when is a, in EQTL is actually a better question. I'll get, get to an example here. This is one of my favorite recent papers, and it might seem a little bit, uh, uh, you know, diving into the weeds of biology, but I want to explain why this is so important. Um, because it really showed that biology is all about context. So um, what they're showing here is, in this particular case, there's this SNP at this particular locus in this gene. And if you look at individuals, so they got a bunch of cells from individuals in a dish, and if you look at the expression levels of this gene, and, and uh, people who have, at this one particular region of the genome in AA, have higher levels of gene expression, AG or GG have lower levels. This is a classic expression quantitative trait locus, right? The expression levels of the gene change depending on what genotype you have. But then what they did here is they stimulated the cells with lipopolysaccharide, LPS. It's a part of a bacterial sort of coating that causes inflammation. And guess what? At, at, at two hours of LPS stimulation, the EQTL completely goes away. And uh, this is my favorite part. At 24 hours, it reverses direction. So at 24 hours of, of stimulation uh, from this inflammatory uh, agent, Actually, you thought people with GG had low expression levels of the gene, but actually 24 hours later, they actually have the highest expression levels of the gene. And here's another one uh, where you might think, oh, there's actually no EQTL, right? So if you're just looking at the cells in a dish, you might think, oh, well, uh, this, there's no relationship between this part of the genome and expression levels of the gene. So we might even, some biologists might be so bold to say, this is a non-functional part of the genome. This is, this is not an interesting part. But guess what? If you stimulate it with LPS, at 24 hours, there is an EQTL. Same thing here with the stimulating with, uh, um, uh, I thought it was TNF, or interferon uh, gamma, right? So it looks like this region of the genome is non-functional, but at, at two hours, at 24 hours, it has different uh, gene expression levels. So only under the right context and the right time was this uh, part of the genome functional. And actually, they have really nice figures in this paper showing at different time points under different stimulations what different parts of the genome had functional relationships with certain genes. So right, if you, can, you can almost imagine this as a, as a movie in your head as, as you're stimulating uh, cells with these uh, inflammatory um, cytokines that different parts of the genome seem to, to have function at different times of the, uh, of the stimulation. So this is what we're really missing, right? And uh, so you can do things with, uh, you know, cells in a dish and, and blast them with inflammatory cytokines, but I think what we really need is to, to establish the digital phenotype to really understand, uh, well, maybe this part of the, of the genome is only functional, you know, after you've had uh, Red Bull and you've listened to heavy metal, right? Because then, oh, then actually, now I see a relationship between, you know, this, this gene and this blood thing, right? So we're missing all this important context that really lets us understand uh, the functional uh, parts of the genome. There's a nice paper in uh, Nature Biotech on the digital phenotype, sort of discussing uh, how we might uh, start to map that out. And what we really need, and, you know, of course we want to collect big data, but we really need to collect long dynamic data. And I think the, the perspective uh, and the approach we need to do this is from the perspective of precision wellness, and I'll get into that in a second. But a lot of people talk about precision medicine. Um, but I think it's a very hard conversation because we need to have lots of genomic data and digital uh, data, phenotype data on a huge populations to really make this work. So what we, the conversation has mostly been now, and even the conversation from the White House on precision medicine has been, oh, let's study cancer patients, right? But when you're saying, 
when you're, when you're starting the conversation about you know, building up uh, data repositories and sequencing huge populations from the disease perspective, it's very hard because uh, on one hand, you know, people don't like to think about disease and most people think they'll never get a disease, so they don't see the value in, in genomics. I was just in Canada where they're, they're trying to have all these efforts to try to sequence whole provinces like British Columbia and they can't get anybody interested in it because they keep talking about it from a disease standpoint and nobody cares about disease. Nobody thinks that we're going to get a disease, right? But I think we really need to start thinking about it from the wellness standpoint and really trying to understand what a normal healthy person looks like. By the way, we have no idea what a normal healthy person looks like. Even from something like a you know, T lymphocyte count, count that we measure every day in patients, we actually have no idea what the normal or dynamic range of T lymphocyte count or white blood cell count is in a normal healthy population say on an hour by hour basis. So um, what we really need to collect uh, is, is many, many layers of this long data um, and really understand these dynamics um, of uh, what even a healthy normal individual is before they start falling off into these cliffs, right? It's another analogy. It's like, uh, you know, trying to understand car accidents but only being interested in, um, you know, measuring, um, you know, information from crash scenes and not being at all interested in what's happening on the highways. Uh, and how cars operate and what happens before people get into a crash, right? And that's really how we study uh, diseases today. And when we have all, this, uh, all these layers of multidimensional data on individuals, we actually have methods to be able to put this together. Um, one of our uh, areas of strength at Mount Sinai is probabilistic graphical modeling, modeling, Bayesian network inference. And we can build networks that look like this, right? So if we have a large number of individuals where we say have genetics, digital health devices, imaging, Maybe this is a, 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 the expression level of a gene. Maybe this is a protein in blue. Maybe yellow is actually uh, data coming from an activity tracker or a voxel from an fMRI imaging scan. Doesn't matter. If we have lots of high dimensional data on a huge uh, population of individuals, we can start to see and learn from the data. This gets back to that physics idea I mentioned before. Learn from the data how biology is wired. We're a little bit different in terms of the literature as we sort of tend to ignore the literature uh, and actually say, well, if things are true, we should actually be able to relearn these things or reobserve these things from the raw data, right, uh, so on biology. So if you measure microbiome, genome, proteome, uh, activity, et cetera, from a large population of individuals, let the data tell us how the biology is wired. It organizes into networks and forms networks of networks. And we can actually begin to understand how information flows between these networks. So we break these correlation networks into causal networks. Um, and actually get to the, at the point that was mentioned before in understanding big mechanism. Um, so I have, you know, we have 50 or 60 papers I could send you on exactly how we do this. Um, and, you know, uh, the, point, the point I made before is that we need to really start to accumulate this stuff on uh, populations uh, and really the population level. And that was traditionally hard under the, uh, traditional, I mean, under the traditional academic research model, but as Stephen Friend mentioned, um, we have a big shift in consumer health tools as a driver of, of data-driven healthcare and data aggregation. Um, I always like to ask is, you know, where is most of the health data going to be in five to ten years? Not so sure it's going to be at Mount Sinai or other hospitals, even though Mount Sinai has got uh, several million patients. Um, Apple and, and Google and others getting into healthcare in a big way. Uh, a big uh, thing that happened, which Stephen mentioned, was Research Kit. We, we, along with Sage, were one of the groups that got to work and develop the original research kit to turn all one billion iOS devices in the world, six billion iOS devices, into clinical research um, tools. As being one of the founding sort of groups to work on Apple Research Kit with Apple, um, we got to develop one of the first apps. It's in the App Store, an asthma health app. Uh, and how this is working, this is a study that's underway right now. Uh, we have our asthma health app here running. We're getting activity tracker data. We're getting Bluetooth spirometry, Bluetooth inhaler data. And of course, we're getting GPS information on these asthma patients. By the way, there's 10,000 now in the study enrolled in two months uh, in 46 states. And um, uh, collecting all this data in a real-time patient cloud and actually pulling in environmental data like geospatial data, like what was the traffic uh, at that location, what was the uh, pollen count, actually working with groups at Cornell uh, who work on the Pathomap project to sequence New York uh, microbiome to actually figure out what bacteria were in that area, right? So putting all this data in, in a real-time uh, patient cloud and learning in real-time uh, how patients uh, dynamically move through this cloud relative to other patients and redefine that asthma population with data. Hopefully, hoping to realize this um, 
vision that I think Eric Topol articulated very well in the cell paper of a GIS information for human beings, right? So it's not that you have this disease or this other disease and we'll put you in this bucket, but taking all these layers of information you're all the way from your social graph down to your molecular level, can we define your coordinates in a high dimensional space, right? So you don't have a disease, these are your coordinates relative to all other human beings. And this is what we know about this coordinate space and this is how you move from one space to another. And we actually have a research center that just launched at Mount Sinai that I'm the director of called the Harris Center for Precision Wellness. Um, where we're really going to integrate digital health, data science, clinical medicine, molecular profiling. We're going to get uh, healthy people in their 90s, 80s, 70s, 60s, 50s, 40s, et cetera, and actually measure them like nobody's ever been measured before. You know, 40 different devices, uh, data collected uh, all day long on them. They're, going to, they're also going to get deep, deep molecular data, uh, you know, microbiome, uh, immune profiling, et cetera. And we're going to learn and build this map to really understand what, is even, what do even normal, healthy people look like across all these dimensions. And really try to realize something like this. Uh, you know, your health trajectory is not a linear X, Y plot, right? So there are many, many possible states of health and disease. And the goal is really to understand what state you're in now and where, do you, where can you go from here, right? So how do we look at your personal network, keep you on the healthy peaks and out of the disease valleys, right? At any one point in time, that might be exercise. It might be a drug. It might mean changing your diet. We don't know, right? Because it all depends on what state, energy state you're in now and what energy state you want to go to. And we want to be able to, to map that out and inform that in real time. So sorry I went a little over time, but uh, thank you for your attention.